And this is KC9 DKV in CUSO with N9 GTO. Good evening. Good evening, sir. And we are gathered here on uh, 3815. Uh, for what purpose? I have a little bit of chit chat and talk about Milton Mets and, and talk about audio and talk about radio and just have a whole lot of fun. Well, which one of those is going to come first? Uh, let's talk about Milton Metz. Uh, when did you first meet Milton, Over? I first met Milton in uh, 1970 when I went to work for WHAS. And uh, he, was, uh, he was already a legend in 1970. Now, at the time in 1970, was he doing a morning or afternoon show? Uh, he was doing an evening show. He was doing his uh, call-in uh, Mets here show uh, about uh, 7 p.m. to, um, I think, uh, 11 or, or 10, thereabouts. Wow. And, and how old were you then at 1970? Oh, uh, gosh, uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, but I wasn't, uh, I was over 21 for sure. I knew what I was doing. All right, well, we don't want to divulge too much, but anyway, uh, uh, wow. It, 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 wasn't he a, a weatherman for a while there? Uh, yeah, he, uh, he uh, functioned in TV uh, just as well as in radio, but I, I didn't have much to do with the, uh, the uh, video aspect of uh, WHAS, only in the, uh, uh, the radio side and in the production. And um, I had... Uh, I was in North Carolina at the time at uh, a station in, um, well, actually I was working for a, um, a, a group of stations called Smiles uh, Broadcasting, which owned the legal limit of radio stations at that time, which was six. And um, I uh, was uh, time to uh, move along, and uh, I had the option of going to uh, uh, Des Moines, Iowa, or Louisville, Kentucky, and... Um, I'd lived in Nashville as a kid of 16, and I worked for Wino Radio in Nashville, which was the only uh, country music uh, station in the country music capital of the world at that time. Uh, of course, I wasn't uh, a personality as such. I was a uh, glorified uh, board operator for, uh, uh, they would run remotes quite a lot of remotes on the weekends and uh, so I would be a board op for the remotes which is the guy that puts in the commercials and um, you know reads the news and stuff like that but anyway so I'd lived in uh, Nashville and so I had the opportunity of uh, living in uh, Louisville or in Des Moines Iowa so I picked uh, Louisville Roger Roger well, let's go back just a little bit. When you were in Nashville at the time, in nineteen uh, in the sixties, late sixties, uh, Nashville, you know, country music, uh, it, you know, the the I understand that you had the Grand Ole Opry, and they would be on uh, WSM. Is that right? Oh, Roger, Roger, yeah. And it was really amazing because uh, in the daytime, all those fifty KW stations were playing uh, MOR music. But uh, at nighttime, uh, WSM became the uh, country giant, and uh, WLAC became the uh, R&B uh, giant. But in the daytime, they were both like MR music. Right, right. Yeah, and then you had the, what, what a lot of people don't know, you had the big swing music, the big band. You had a country swing before, you know, in the early uh, uh, 1900s, and you had the big band era. Uh, so you know, like the you know the different ones, uh, the big uh, uh, Glenn M Miller and all those uh, as well, and you had very split offs and country music back then with the Grand Ole Opry. Uh, it, it it was a, a little bit different than it is today. Everything seems to have taken a different direction at very uh, uh, you know times of, of the year. Seventy three, seventy five, seventy seven. Uh, you know, after the death of of the of the king as well. But uh, getting back to Milton Metz, uh, you know, 95 years of being on this earth, that is something else to, you know, he, he passed away on uh, January the 12th of 2017 at 95 years old. So I would say that uh, you really, uh, at the time you were young, you met, met a guy that was awesome, and you had a good career, and he was able to go on with it. Uh, 
you couldn't ask for anything else. Being young like that's kind of like serving the apprenticeship, over. Oh, Roger, Roger. Yeah, I came to uh, uh, WHAS uh, for uh, a reason, and one of those reasons was that uh, I was uh, technically inclined as well as uh, uh, commercially uh, uh, producing uh, uh, commercials and, uh, and programs. So I had a technical understanding that uh, was as equal with uh, my production. And uh, at the time, uh, WHAS was going through a... Um, shall we say, a growing pain, growing curve, and that uh, the station manager, Hugh Barr, was uh, interested in um, uh, what was called combo at the time. And combo was the ability for the on-air jock to run his own uh, control board and for production people to be able to operate their own control boards. To that point, the, uh, the engineers had jurisdiction over almost all moving parts and uh, it was their hands that were, that were at the controls. And uh, so Hugh uh, wanted a more, how shall we say, um, uh, uh, gliding kind of a uh, production on the air as opposed to a um, kind of a stilted you tell them what and then they have to do kind of thing whereas if you're doing your own thing it's going to be a lot smoother and he recognized that so uh, uh, you know I was like the canary in the cage in that uh, I would uh, work with uh, three engineers doing my uh, uh, controls uh, in the um, uh, control room studio A master control and um, so I would work on a daily basis with three engineers on two hour shifts uh, and uh, it was a matter of them um, you know um, well I was kind of trailblazing uh, for uh, Hugh as far as being the canary in the cage as to uh, reading between the lines as far as what the engineers were saying to uh, management and what really was was happening there and uh, so it was kind of like blazing a trail between uh, two unions my AFTRA and their uh, engineers union and uh, you have to be very careful when you're uh, running between two unions there because uh, either one of them uh, if you screw up will step on you so basically what you're saying is you were riding the fence no, I was uh, I was in the uh, trenches actually, you know, trying to uh, get a job done, and it uh, became a situation where uh, you, you know not only was I t telling them what uh, to do, uh, but uh, it became necessary to tell them how to do, because. Uh, you know, it was a matter of efficiency, and, and we uh, developed uh, quite a few uh, production techniques. Uh, one was called uh, Editech, which is uh, basically uh, two uh, Ampex stereo machines uh, lashed together that you could edit machine to machine uh, in um, a way that uh, was similar to uh, video editing. And uh, we saved a lot of time uh, making audio edits that way versus uh, uh, the, um, you know, doing a splice edit. So basically you were there when they became the 24-hour operation. Uh, Roger, yes. Uh -huh. And uh, we, uh, again, uh, tried to... Um, facilitate everybody's uh, uh, situation, you know, and uh, obviously uh, when one uh, union um, acquiesces on a particular point, it usually uh, involves money, <laughs> you know, and uh, so it's just a matter of uh, time and money, and eventually uh, Hugh got his uh, combo on the air and uh, in production. That was amazing. At the time, it was ruled by the, the uh, Bingham family, uh, which owned and published the, the Louisville Courier Journal and Louisville Times. Uh, wow. <laughs> uh, such such a big family and a, a big thing going on and all the changes that took part. Uh, wow. Just absolutely amazing. But at the time, at, at that era, it was a great, great station to listen to. Over. 
Roger, yes, it uh, was, um, had been for, for many years a Clear Channel station, and that's when the Clear Channel actually meant something, that, uh, you know, the, they uh, had a signal over three quarters of the United States, and that was one of the reasons that uh, I decided not to go to uh, L.A. or Chicago or New York, because I could, pe I could compete on a national level um, in... Um, in radio without having to go to those metropolises because uh, WHAS did uh, uh, penetrate three quarters of the uh, country and um, so um, that was uh, the neat part about uh, a clear channel station unlike uh, you know this uh, company that uh, took the name clear channel which is the height of uh, I don't know what you would call that but uh, certainly they never lived up to their name Clear Channel, uh, the you know, and and then when people realized what a um, what a terrible company they were, they just uh, changed their name and started anew all over again. Now, what is the M O R music? Uh, the old line M O R music. What 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 is the meaning of that? In the early seventies, they modernized modernized the M O R music. What was that? So basically a general uh, type of uh, music programming, you know, not rock and roll, but uh, uh, middle of the road. That's, uh, you know, what uh, MOR stood for, middle of the road. And, uh, you know, it was before talk radio. And, uh, you know, it just, unfortunately, um, I got, well, fortunately for me, uh, I spent uh, 50 years in broadcasting when the creativity uh, meant something. Today, there is no creativity in radio. Uh, Clear ch Channel, uh, I Heart Radio has um, almost single-handedly destroyed the commercial radio operation in the uh, America. And we'll pause for station identification. This is N9 GTO with KC9 VKV. KC9, VKV with N9 GTO, and uh, we were talking about... Uh, Commercial radio and uh, uh, WHAS and uh, Milton Metz and uh, like I say, uh, Milty um, uh, had a had a great life. Uh, and um, you know, the opportunity for that kind of a life in broadcasting today is uh, almost non-existent, not possible, because of the um, elements uh, that. Uh, are involved in the ownership, mainly uh, iHeartRadio. 1,400 radio stations are sitting on the precipice of disaster. They are sitting um, underfunded. Uh, iHeartRadio has uh, managed to um, uh, pull every cent that they can out of these, just suck the blood out right out of these 1,400 radio stations. And uh, just work. they were caught recently trying to uh, smuggle $20 million out of the country from uh, another organization of the iHeart uh, umbrella that actually made some money, and they were trying to uh, shelter that money from their um, investors by getting it out of the country into uh, uh, offshore bank accounts, and uh, uh, unfortunately for them, uh, their investors caught wind of it, and uh, because it was an illegal act, the investors uh, sought to retrieve all of their financial uh, m uh, considerations out that it were outstanding due immediately because iHeart was uh, trying to uh, become involved in illegal operations, and uh, they went to a judge in Texas and sought... Um, you know, uh, a relief from the uh, uh, the uh, possibility of trying to repay all this money that they have no way of repaying. And the judge uh, sided with them that uh, they would uh, give uh, iHeartRadio some more time to uh, come up with the capital, which is where they are at the moment. Wow, sounds like they're living on borrowed time, and that's just my point of view of it. Uh, switching gears just a little bit, do you remember when Gary uh, Burbank, uh, when he left WAKY in 73, he had an elaborate prank about pretending he was fatally shot by a disgusted listener? Do you remember that? Wow, well, uh, let's see. Was that who shot JR? I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. <laughs> At that point, he moved to New Orleans for a 
for a brief stint with uh, a WNOE uh, in New Orleans. And of course, Burbank was all over the place. You know what? He was having some fun. And uh, I think he wound up back at, at WHAS, uh, uh, and, you know, after it was all said and done. Or? Well, I think he uh, went to, uh, he, well, let's see, yeah, he went to uh, Canada also there on that trip. Uh, <laughs> and then they came back from Canada to uh, HAS, as I, as I recall the situation. But uh, uh, Gary is also uh, one of the greatest broadcasters, I think, that uh, uh, this country's ever seen, or even the world, actually. Uh, you know, I've, I've never run across... Uh, uh, a, um, uh, a radio quote announcer that is m more creative than Gary. He would do uh, like uh, 15 bits a day religiously, you know, and there, there's nobody uh, that does 15 pieces of uh, production a day for their show. Oh, oh, I agree. I enjoyed the Earl Pitts. Uh, the full-blooded redneck who makes a daily commentary on everything from political to family and friends. Roger. Well, he had a whole, whole cast of characters, uh, well-rounded. And um, the, the thing about it is, though, that uh, Gary was, um, mm, let's see how to put this, uh, high-strung, as well as he, you know, might be that creative. And uh, it would not be uncommon, I would... Uh, come in uh, to the uh, production room after he finished and there would be um, a, a chair uh, s uh, in the hanging out of the uh, wall baffle. Now for those that don't know what a wall baffle is, uh, in uh, radio studios or in audio studios they put uh, rounded baffles on the walls uh, which are like rounded um, hmm, plywood pieces that uh, make the sound, instead of bouncing back and forth, it diver, uh, div diverts the uh, sound and thereby minimizes echoes and things. And uh, so these are basically uh, um, what you would say uh, uh, plywood uh, baffles. And uh, so there would be a chair sticking in out of the baffle that somebody had gotten so upset that they slammed a I'd thrown a chair into the baffle. Uh, just one of the things, you know, you, if it had been a person, man, it would be uh, uh, the job for the EMS for sure. Oh, yeah, and he used to be Reverend Deuteronomy Skaggs, the preacher that encouraged all his listeners to dig deep in their jeans and pull out the greens. Uh, Skaggs and old Bernice and all of them, uh, they was a character in those days. And old Ranger Bob and, oh, Lord, on and on and on. So like you said... 15 stints a day. That was a hell of a thing. Roger. KC9 VKV with N9GTO. Uh, I was uh, one afternoon walking to the parking lot with Gary, and uh, we were just about to the, our cars when uh, we were approached by a band of Harry Krishners uh, ringing their bells and dancing around, and uh, I wasn't real sure whether we were trying to be saved or robbed, but, but uh, Gary uh, broke into his Deuteronomy Skaggs uh, character and just uh, told them, you know, that uh, they, were, they were going to hell and their lives would never be the same because he would uh, personally speak to God about them. And uh, they uh, were so uh, afraid, uh, they uh, just took off running and they, they weren't afraid of going to hell, they were afraid of Gary. Did you ever meet a man named David Dick? No, name sounds familiar, but I, I don't recall. Okay, just just kind of you know, just for one, uh, David Dick, John Zelliger, uh, 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 Kaywood Lefford. Oh yeah, Kaywood. Uh, <laughs> Kaywood is one of the uh, all-time uh, great uh, sportscasters in the in the world. I uh, called the uh, Kentucky Derby many times, uh, and uh, also did a great stint in uh, basketball. Yeah, he's also yes, yeah. He was a he, he's a native of Harlan County. Right, right. Yeah, and uh, Van Vance. Van is, uh, Van is uh, great also as far as uh, basketball. 
Van, uh, first time I met uh, Van Vance uh, in our uh, our um, combo operation, uh, uh, you would be, uh, the jock would be on the air with his control board, and then there would be, uh, for all practical purposes, a table on the other side of the control board, and the uh, news people would uh, come in and um, uh, sit down at that uh, table and do their... Uh, do their newscast from there, and the, then the uh, sports guys would uh, come and do theirs uh, from the same uh, same uh, place. And uh, the first time I met Van, he was doing that, and Van, I, you know, he spoke so low. He was down here like this, a very low voice. But his his uh, the thing is, you know, as you speak, as you gain lower resonance, you. Uh, you lose the um, the uh, the decibels. Your your voice gets very soft as it gets low, and I could not hear hardly hear him acoustically in the room. It was only the microphone that he was working on, and uh, he just sounded like uh, 20 feet tall on the microphone. But in the room, you could barely hear him. Oh yeah. And one of the things about uh, old Lefford was he would get on there and say, Hello, everybody, this is K. Wood Lefford. I'll never forget that. Well, yeah, he was, um, he was every bit uh, in his own right, as uh, Milty was, uh, truly a, a, a star, um, a sage star. He, was, um, he knew what he was doing. And uh, he had uh, a career that that uh, people today would just envy. And this all started with a tube and your grandfather, right? Yeah, Roger. Yeah, my grandfather was uh, on the air uh, before the FCC. <laughs> That's awesome. That is absolutely awesome. But uh, yeah, there there are so many different uh, aspects of, of radio like amateur radio that uh, with broadcasting television t you know tv the uh all the different things and technology is changing uh like it was back in the 70s and 80s it's constantly changing either you change the times or the times will change you and uh, that's what happens to a lot of them but the ones that are really can stay in there uh, such as Kay Wood and Metz and all of them they have definitely left their mark on the industry and uh, he will be missed definitely at the, at the crusade for children. That's something that everyone loved to see Uncle Melty. Back to you. Oh, Roger, Roger, yeah, and the Crusade for Children, you, you can't talk enough about that. Uh, that was one of the things when I first came to HAS that uh, I was uh, found so outstanding is that that uh, organization um, just, uh, you know, put on the greatest show, and and the, the, all the money that they uh, uh, got from the contributions, uh, uh, 90, I would say 98% of that money went to uh, the uh, the groups that were, you know, in need of uh, of it, and uh, there was very little uh, money that was used for the operation, the actual physical operation of the Crusade for Children. Unlike a lot of other organizations that will take uh, maybe 50 percent, 60 percent of the uh, of the cash flow right off the top and uh, delegate it for um, their overhead. You know, that's that's ridiculous. Well, you know, it was amazing. In 1956, they raised $187,000. Right. That's that's uh, chicken feed compared to what they're doing now. I mean, what they were doing, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, $6 million, I think. Oh, it's unbelievable. It's actually unbelievable. The, you know, the... It, the legacy that they have, uh, the, everything they've done, you name it, uh, uh, it's just absolutely a, a, a great organization. It, t to me, the organization, uh, as a child, they actually provided hearing tests for, for children that had to have special hearing tests and stuff that, that the normal families could not afford, and WHAS was there. Right, the Crusade for Children, and I tell you what, what how apropos this may be, uh, let's end this with a uh, vignetted um, 
program of the Crusade for Children. This was recorded back in the 70s and it uh, actually uh, is a vignette of the uh, complete program and uh, I think uh, this would be uh, very apropos. Remember the Crusade for Children and uh, in uh, donations. Resolve quad split. Take camera three. Stand by. Kill Bill. It's a most unusual day. Feel like throwing my worries away. If my heart won't behave in the usual way, well, there's only one thing to say. It's a most unusual, most unusual, most unusual day. This is the 1979 Crusade for Children. From Kentuckiana and all across the country have come television and recording stars and hundreds of volunteers who have offered their services. But here are the real Crusade stars, the mentally and physically handicapped children of Kentucky and southern Indiana. Whether or not their lives can be made worthwhile depends on you. There are people eating people, there is sunshine everywhere. There are people greeting people and a feeling of spring in the air. It's a most unusual time. I'm feeling my temperature climb. If my heart won't be in the usual way, well, there's only one thing to say. It's a most unusual, most unusual, most unusual. ceremonies for the next 24 hours, Mr. Crusade, Jim Walton. Thank you so much. And this is the reason we're all here tonight, for Sheila Thyler. She needs a helping hand, and I think we're going to give it to her tomorrow when that last diamond dollar has been dropped into the fishbowl. She and thousands like her will say, thank you so much. You've done it again. Speaking of thanks, we'd like to thank some other people, Judy Marshall and Joanne Hale, of course, the Patsy Bloor dancers, Dave Jones and his motet singers, and, of course, our big crusade orchestra directed by Mel Owens. Now, you know the purpose of the show. You've been here 25 years with us, I think, most of you. And you know we're here to raise as much money as we possibly can to help as many handicapped children in Kentucky and southern Indiana as we can. And our first entertainer is an actress and recording artist, and... Last night, someone said to her, what are you going to sing? And I think I can quote her almost verbatim. It was something like, honey, I'm going to do it all. Della Reese.
to know is, where is the energy shortage, child? Huh? Oh, listen, that's very sweet. But, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to say this because I'm a stranger in town. And I've only You're been here... Not a here. stranger anymore, well, I'll tell you that. You, thank you. I've only been here a couple of days. And I've learned a few things about this crusade in the last couple of days and about the people who run this crusade. They worked very hard for this crusade for you. And it's your turn to work very hard and show that their efforts have not been in vain. So while you're sitting there enjoying the show and enjoying the efforts of these people, please call. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. I'm looking over and I'm seeing a man who has all of those gold records. Bobby Rydell. Let me get in there. for that man, huh? You must have thought that I was lonely. You came to my rescue. But now I know what this must be. How could so much love be in I swear it's true It's all I can do Can't you see This one's for you This one's for you This one's for you For you Let's welcome back once again, Mr. Dean Shepard. More than the greatest love the world has known This is the love I give to you alone More than the simple words I try to say I only live to love you on the board right now is 86,948 at about 12 minutes before midnight. This is Miss Yvonne Over. Memories like the corners of my mind Misty water-colored memories of the Is our board fixed back here yet? Yeah, I can read it now. $93,499. This is the fellow who is the all-night DJ, I'll have you know, from WKRP up in Cincinnati. That's just up the uh, pike apiece. And you know him, of course, as Venus Flytrap. Let's welcome Tim Reed. Tim? I've heard it for a while. Sound familiar? Oh, yeah. It's nice. Well, what do you think of the kids? I, I've fallen in love with a young, little young girl over there. She's crying now, of course, because I've gone. You've you gone yeah. away. What's your name again? April. April, all right. <laughs> and you have some money for me, is that right? Thank you, April. Wow, that's a lot of money. Well, can I get a kiss? Ah, it's all about love, isn't it? <laughs> Now, welcome Pee Wee King. I was waltzing with my darling to the Tennessee Wall when an old friend 
I happen to see. I introduced him to my loved one the night they were playing the beautiful Tennessee. Can we do a little camera switch here and uh, go over and find Gary Burbank somewhere? With you don't the, have to find him. I watch him daily. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to find Gary somewhere because he is the one that is talking with the lovely young ladies who take your pledge when you call. Gary, isn't that true? <laughs> yes. You could be talking through this. And it could be going into her here right on television. Guess, then, who, guess who I saw coming in here this morning? Who? Porky Chadwick. You're kidding. First time I've ever seen him this time of the morning. <laughs> this is when he's out normally. Now, these ladies are from South Central Bell. Two of them are from the Kentucky State Home for the Not Quite All There. I'm telling you right now. Strange. What is your name? Sandy Donahue. Sandy? Okay, thank you. You hung up on somebody just when I asked your name? Okay, but like, you know our telephone number, so give us a call. As if, I got a few uh, pledges to read. Mr. and Miss Jackie Trent of 5118 Fay Avenue, $5. Frank and Nellie Bird, Madison, Indiana, $24. Mr. and Mrs. Francis B. Whitehouse, Jr., 1301 Abbey Wood Road, $120. Jerry, you got some pledges? I sure do, Gary. And uh, we just had someone walk up to the back door a while ago with a $5 pledge, $5 in cash, that is, in memory of Howard Stinson III. $10,208? Yes. So oh, that's tremendous. The squared answers are on their way. Look out, fire departments. I'm Jim Michelle with Convenient Food Marts. We are happy to announce that this year's grand total is $8,000. $6.91. Oh, all right. $6.91. Can you go ahead and put it in there? Oh, you got her open up all the way. $6.91 out of the Taylor Brothers here. I'm John Clark with General Electric, and I'm chairman of the Employee Community Fund, which represents all of the employees at General Electric. <sighs> General Electric Employees Community Fund to the Crusade for Children, $60,000. Salem, Indiana, and Larry Brown's got a few words for us. This year we have $10,197.92. $10,192. All right. $10,192. Fisher Packing Company. This amount that they are giving this year amounts to $32 per employee. That total, and I'll say this one out loud, is $16,000. We're getting close to $300,000. Look at that, $296,898. Okay, and we're over here with the St. Matthews Fire Department with... Rick Albers and Kenton Wanahan. Okay, what's the grand total? Gives us a grand total of $25,500 even. That is remarkable. Mutual is here. We think we'll just give you the figure and then we go home. $19,187.10. $19,000! It looks like a bunch of people from Middletown to me. That's right. I can tell them a mile away, Jerry. <laughs> The grand total this year is $20,004.41. I'm here with the South Dixie Fire Department, and uh, Chief, do you have a few things to say? We'd like to give this in memory of Charles Lee, the past Chief of South Dixie Fire Department. A total of $16,670.40. Oh, the South Dixie Fire Department, let's listen to it. The Archbishop is with us, and this means a very dramatic point in our birth. You don't bring any boots full of money, but... No, uh, you bring the word. We bring the word. That's important. Today's the word to get it out. Evangelization is the word. Right. So our grand total this year is $67,700.75. <laughs> We've got another group of uh, 30 or 40 volunteer fire department people, uh, scouts, McMahon volunteer fire department, and they got a new record. And our grand total this year, grand total this year is $19,000 even. $19,000 even from the McMahon volunteer fire department. How about that? Pour it in. 
We are ready over here. We have got the Oklahoma Fire Department with a cast of thousands. Forty-one thousand five hundred dollars. Wow. Forty-one thousand dollars. We are here with a group from Camp Taylor. This thing gets more incredible as we roll along. It's amazing. As you'll note on the board, we are approaching nine hundred thousand dollars. And with Pat Wright, the chief at Camp Taylor, our total for this year's 1979 Crusade, $23,739.83. Fantastic. That's it. I want you to pay attention to some very important initials. This is Milton Metz, and PRP stands for one of the great organizations, Pleasure Ridge Park Fire Department. When they come, silence reigns because they come strong men, women, and children. And we don't know what they're bringing, but they're bringing a lot of good things. And we have a grand total of $58,356.60. I have lots of people, as you can easily see here, representing the Fern Creek Volunteer Fire Department. The grand total was $17,189.86. Oh, and that's the good from Fern Creek Volunteer Fire Department. Over $17,000. Now the great thing comes forward from the Clark County Citizens Group. Right. And we have $48,725.87. Yay! Great! This is Mr. George Krause from over in New Albany. How are you doing, Mr. Krause? My pleasure. There's his daughter standing next to him. Hi. How are you? She's been a fan of yours since she was a teenager. Get over there and make her happy, huh? I can't give you an exact figure because we're still kind of counting money over New Orleans. Still has some money coming in. But I can tell you this. It is in excess of $30,000. In excess of $30,000. Phyllis, before the show, you remember you wrote something down in the book, and uh, you wrote down your guess and my guess on the end yes. of the show. I think we you, split it about. We 50, just about 50, did, yeah. did we? Uh huh. Mm -hmm. uh, you said two hundred, one right. million two hundred. I said one million two twenty-five. It comes out one million two hundred seventeen five seventy-two. You know, our joy at this fantastic total is tinged with, with sorrow today because Jim is retiring. And Jim, you know, we found no way to package love and respect, but knowing your love of silver, we have a little gift for you. And I want to say it will be etched, and this is what it will look like. Wayne, would you hold it for the camera, please? With our love, Jim. <laughs> Too much. thing I can think to say is I think personally I've gotten more out of it than anybody else has. I mean, it's just been, it's been a wonderful experience and uh, one I'll never forget. Well, we'll never forget you, Jimmy. And we, we come to the time when we must say to the community, thank you. Today we'd like to say you are the most generous people in the entire world. Each of you, from those of you who gave a quarter to $10,000, we hope you feel very proud of the total of the Crusade for Children for this 26th year. Those of us who have brought you the Crusade are glad that we could be a part in providing the setting for your generosity so that all of our handicapped children will have a much better life. God bless America.